Hello plant lovers, it is Matthew in Melbourne welcoming you back to my channel and in fact the kitchen. I post every week and I post about growing cold, cool, intermediate orchids here in Melbourne, Australia without any help from grow lights or humidifiers or a greenhouse. So plant lovers, if that sounds of any interest, do hit subscribe. I post every Friday. And this week, plant lovers, what do I have before me? A foil snack pack. <laughs> but in fact, this is a plant that I have just received and it is a division of a Cilogeny. And I thought, you know what? Following on from my video a few weeks ago about what do you pot your orchid in, I thought I might just show you what I'm going to do in terms of potting this division of a Cilogeny, the mix I'm going to use, the whys, the wherefores, and then where it's going to go. So plant lovers, without any further ado, let us take a closer look at this division. All right, so first things first then, what plant are we looking at? We are looking at Cilogeny aspirata, which as you can see, look at that, is such a fabulously healthy plant. And I got this from a company called, you can see there, Dark Star Orchids, and I'll put that link below. If you're in Australia, they are a nursery that specializes in species orchids, and this is a species orchid. Now, I must confess to be going on a bit of a Cilogeny binge because a lot of them are higher altitude Himalayan plants that just seem to thrive really well in my climate here in Melbourne. And to give you an indication of what that is. So in Australia, we don't have the same hardness zones as you have in the USA because cold isn't an issue here. It's dry and heat that are the issues in Australia. Um, so it's kind of difficult to give you an idea, except to say roughly equates to a USDA zone 99A. Essentially, we are a warm temperate, wet Mediterranean. So we have hot, dry summers and cold, wet winters that don't freeze. And that is the thing. I mean, that is here in Melbourne outside in, in various parts of the countryside. Near Melbourne, you do get sub-zero um, centigrade temperatures, but not here in the city. So that's the key. A lot of orchids can actually manage going down that low, which is 32 degrees Fahrenheit, um, without any ill effects. And you could be a little bit surprised by how many orchids can in fact take that temperature drop in winter, nighttime minimums. And so part of my sort of thing is what can I grow outside all year? Undercover, so protected from the rain, but essentially they're gonna be subject to those cold nighttime or winter minimums. And I have found Cilogenes, not all, but a lot, simply love it. Now this one, Aspirata, is a species that's found geographically sort of in a block from Malaysia all the way across Borneo, Sulawesi into Papua New Guinea and actually all the way across to the Solomon Islands. So kind of in an arc basically across the top of Australia but from relatively low levels to quite high altitudes and that is the thing that makes orchids generally more cool cold tolerant is because the higher they are the colder the winter nighttime minimums are going to be. Of course, it's not that simple, but it's a good rule of thumb for me that generally anything from a higher altitude is gonna do reasonably well as long as it's not gonna freak out with us summer maximums. Anyway, I'm waffling on. That is why I am going on my Cilogeny binge, and this one is just fantastic. Look at the size of this plant. Anyway, I'll come in closer, we'll unwrap it, and start to just talk about what I'm going to do with this. Okay, plant lovers, so this is how I have received the division. And as you probably know, a division means it is a part of an already mature plant. So literally, you have divided your plant because it's too big. And so you can see that it has been put in a little sphagnum just to protect the roots. But you can see here a very healthy and extensive root system. So I am just going to knock off a little bit of any of that remaining medium but look at these roots very very healthy goodness me look at that one heavens okay so there we go so you can see perhaps here that cilogenies often grow in this sort of rhizomous manner so you have one pseudobulb and then a second one and another one another one so they often will run along the surface of your potting medium and then can in fact create quite extraordinary masses of plant I suppose as the rhizome creeps around often they're best grown in baskets or mounted for that reason so it'll often grow around whatever the container it's in. I of course cannot grow things 
really in baskets because I am in a rental and it's just not that convenient for me. But anyway, I'll show you what I am gonna pop this in, in a minute. Anyway, as we can see, very, very healthy plant. There are four pseudo bulbs which have lost their leaves, older ones. These two with extremely long and healthy leaves would be the youngest pseudo bulbs. Um, they can flower any time from spring through to winter apparently. So we will see. Anyway, these look as though they haven't flowered, which means perhaps they could. All right. Oh, another thing, the name, Sologeny aspirata. You know, I'm always kind of interested about what the names might mean. And aspirata in Latin is actually a derivative of two words. So it is asper, rough, and artus, possessing. So it means possessing roughness. Curious because the leaves aren't particularly rough and the pseudo bulbs aren't particularly rough either. So who knows quite what it is referring to, but maybe there's just a gentle roughness to the leaves and the pseudo bulbs. Anyway, not quite sure where that comes from. But anyway, that aside, let us now bring the other things into play. We need exhibit A, pot and a brass ruler, which I will reveal the needs for later. Look at this pot, see how aerated it is, all those fabulous holes around the side and those little holes at the top you can see, which means I can suspend it. I can put wire through that and actually hang it up, which just means it's really versatile. So I can either use it as a regular pot or as a hanging pot, because as you know, I'm in a temporary home <laughs> until we move into our final house. And Sologenes being epiphytes, uh, this orchid is going to really benefit from all the aeration that the holes in this pot are going to provide. Now, I did tell you the story of this pot <laughs> that it and its siblings I got from a local supplier and they were the last ones that he had. So I will not, plant lovers, put a link to where I got this from. But yes, you can also just drill your own holes in your own terracotta, which I'm not going to be about to start soon. Okay, pot aside, let us now look at the potting medium. We have sphagnum moss, uh, medium-sized bark, which as you can see is medium size, <laughs> uh, charcoal, and then perlite, all of which I will mix together in a mega mix. So I guess one of the things about Sologenes is that, well, in my experience anyway, they do like to be uh, sort of on the moister side, so I need to enable these roots to access more moisture than perhaps I would normally with other orchids that I'm potting. Hence, there's gonna be a bit more sphagnum moss in this mix just to enable these roots to have access to more water. So that is why you can see a huge amount of sphagnum in this mix, which is perhaps more than I would normally give. The perlite will enable the moisture to be retained and the whole thing together is gonna to be just a lot more moisture retentive than perhaps my normal mix would be. So now we mix it all together. Now, the thing is with this sphagnum, it is as it is out of the packet, but for those roots to sort of access more moisture and generally to make it a bit easier to work with, I am going to chop it so that the whole thing mixes together and just settles in those roots better. So, exhibit A, my fabulous Chinese scissors, which came from Shanghai, which I was able to visit before lockdown. So don't ask me to give you a link, alas, but aren't they the most fabulous scissors? Now, unfortunately, the scissors have no marking, just these Chinese characters. So look, if anyone can read them, it might give you the company name, but unfortunately, I don't know. Anyway, they're fabulous, aren't they? So I'm just chopping the sphagnum moss just to make it easier to work with, and it will mix better with all the other ingredients. And it's gonna be easier once it's all chopped and mixed together, just to get into all of those root cavities of the root ball using my fabulous Chinese scissors. Now, aren't they amazing? Do not ask me to <laughs> give you a link to where they came from. I bought them in Shanghai from this amazing um, metalware shop, which had been around since the 17th century. Can you believe it? They're the most beautiful thing, so I'm sorry to tease you thus, but I feel like this is now a cooking show. <laughs> Okay, there's my Julia Child chopping done. Now, we mix, we mix. It's like creating a fabulous bread dough, just mixing it all together. 
I, uh, I always work with, in this way, sphagnum moss dry, because it's just a bit easier to manage. But there are other instances where you would really soak the sphagnum moss first. Um, but in this case, it's just easier to chop it dry and to mix it dry. But I'll give it a good drenching once we have potted the orchid. Okay, mixing done. Doesn't that look light and fluffy? So everything is, um, is all mixed together. Now time to pot the orchid. Okay, so what I'm going to do is sort of basically line the pot just to sort of prevent as much um, material coming out of the holes as possible. And then if we look at the plant, uh, you can kind of see there's a direction to where it's growing. So I'm going to have to sort of pot it to one side of the pot just to enable the, the new growth to continue sort of running across the surface, so giving them a bit more room. I'm basically just going to shove it in and sort of create a bit of a nest, a bit of a nook. As you can see, it's got quite a large root ball, so I sort of need um, a fairly deep um, aperture to put it all in. And once we've put in this sort of basic amount, which is gonna be the base that we put the root ball on, there are two secret magic ingredients that I will also include in that mix at this point. And they are a few grains of a generic slow release fertilizer nothing special about this you could really use anything suitable for pot plants and literally just a few grains not half a teaspoon don't go crazy there you go sprinkle those in and the next secret ingredient is mycorrhizal fungi as you all know i live for this and as you can see, it's sort of a powder and you just put a little bit of a, a dribble in, sort of the same amount of, as you'd put cayenne pepper in a dish really. And mycorrhizal fungi really acts as the go between um, and enables the, the orchids to access the nutrients in the potting mix. So it has a sort of symbiotic relationship and um, enables all the nutrients in that potting mix to become available to the plant, which it otherwise wouldn't be able to get. All right, all right, in we go, getting all those roots in. It's quite a healthy root system, I must say. Taking off the tank, which will be useful. You can actually see there. So there we go. So I just need to get the surface of the pseudo bulbs really sort of at the top of the pot. So I'm holding it up a little bit and then just sort of filling in underneath. So you can see how chopping the sphagnum has just made the whole thing just a little easier to get in. Now you don't want to pack it down too tightly. It needs to be quite light and airy, but you also sort of want to make sure that it's getting into that all those sort of root cavities. So there aren't too many pockets of nothingness because who likes a pocket of nothingness? So packing that in, as I said, more sphagnum moss than I would usually use because I've just found that Sologenes um, in my environment do like more moisture, not to be kept wringing wet, but they just need more moisture than my other uh, epithetic orchid. So yeah, just a bit more sphagnum moss in this mix. So you can really see that uh, around the surface. There we are. Last bits in, um, I think that's gonna be stable enough in the pot. I'm not really gonna to worry too much. You know, sometimes you might have to wire in the plant so that it is not gonna wobble, but I feel that this is gonna be fine once it's sort of in the pot and in position. There we go, always useful to put the tag back in the pot. Um, and there we are, Sologeny aspirata potted. All right. Now, why did I need my fabulous Tom Dixon brass ruler? I hear you all crying. Well, okay, so these are the wires which I just bought online. You can, I got these from eBay. Um, any orchid supplier will have them. Now it has got four hangers, as you can see, and I only have three holes. So we'll have to do a bit of creative bending work, I think. You see there's only a couple of holes, Never mind. I will make it work fear not. So we need the ruler to make sure that the length is the same so that when you hang it up, the pot hangs evenly. So all I'm doing is just measuring from the end to make sure that the, the sort of the hook is going to be the same length. So when I hang it up, the pot is essentially going to be at the same level. Because what I do not like plant lovers is plants hanging skew with. 
So, so we measure and we bend. There you go. So that's what I'm going to do with each of the, um, the hanging stems. All right, each one is now bent. Now, such an easy task, poking them through, <laughs> which is perhaps not so easy, and then bending them up. There you go, look at that, ta-da! There we go. All three, well actually all four, but you know, three holes all attached. And I'm nearly ready to go. There we go, a little judicious bending, and uh, I think I am finished. There we are, plant lovers. How fabulous is that? Look at my fabulous <laughs> metalworking skills, the fabulous pot. So as you can see, um, the sphagnum moss also sort of acts as a bit of a block on the hole so that too much material isn't gonna come out from there. And as I said, because of this sort of hanging system, wherever this orchid ends up in the next house, I can either just use it as a pot on a surface or I can hang it on this cunning hanger which I'm really thrilled to have discovered because um, they're super easy to do yourself and you can kind of hang things anywhere. Anyway, there we go, Sologeny aspirata. I'm still not sure why it's called rough. I really don't feel any roughness with this, but anyway. Um, so I'm gonna go and hang this outside. And in fact, I'll just do a little bit of woo woo and show you where I'm hanging it. In fact, with all my other Sologeny. So it's going to get reasonable dappled light, so not too much strong sunlight. Um, these orchids tend to do better in dappled light, I think. So sort of on the lower end of the shady spectrum. And there we are. I'm gonna give it a good drenching with a little bit of a seaweed solution in the water, diluted down to about 1 6 1 8 for the recommended dose, just to sort of settle it in. I always, uh, when I first repot things, use that seaweed solution for the first water. Just, I think, you know, help settle our plant in. Look at those leaves, aren't they fabulous? Now the other thing that I didn't mention in my potting, which is kind of silly, is that I use, can you see that? Those little bits of shell grit. In fact, that is a shell. Now the wonderful Rachel from Gardening in Duenza did that in her raw case. I thought, oh, that's interesting. Um, and it's calcium. Also, it just adds to the looseness of the mix, but there's calcium in the shells and the mycorrhizal fungi that we put in the mix will help. Well, in fact, the mycorrhizal fungi access all of those minerals from all of the material in the potting mix and makes it available to the plant. So the calcium in those shells is going to be accessed for our plant over a longish period of time. But anyway, Rachel did it. She has fantastic orchids and so I will as well. There we are, plant lovers. Thank you very much for watching this epic repotting of my division of a Sologeny video. I hope you have enjoyed it. Do hit subscribe, leave a comment if you wish. I am a complete amateur, so please don't expect me to know anything or answer anything well. <laughs> I will do my best. Um, I am hopeful, who knows if this is gonna flower for me. Um, it might need a year to recover. People say Sologenes can be a bit touchy about repotting. I have to say I've not experienced that, that mine have all flowered the following season when they should after I've received them and, and had to repot them. So all of mine I received um, like this one bare rooted so I had to repot them when I received them and they've all bloomed for me in the first sort of natural season afterwards so yeah I'm, not, I'm maybe that is just an old wives tale if we can use that expression anymore um, it's a myth it's a myth that perhaps Sologenes don't love being disturbed but I think lots of things don't love being disturbed I guess it's a question of how you do it with gentle touch and season appropriateness Anyway, I am off to hang this fabulous Sologeny up and I look forward to seeing you next week with whatever adventure it might be of my continuing orchid growing journey. But until then, plant lovers, I look forward to seeing you next week.